basketball, football, soccer. Nobody wants to be on a losing team. Everybody wants to be a winner. You can be the leading scorer in your league and still not want to be on the losing team. The media, everyone else can regard you as the best player in whatever field of sport that you choose to play. However, you will still want to have a championship title under your belt. So we talked about before uh, folks wanting to be at the top of the victimhood hierarchy. Uh, for some reason, it seems that people trade blows as far as in, in discussions uh, of who had it worse in America. You know, did the, Jew, did the Jews have it bad? Did blacks have it bad? Did Hispanics have it? Who's had it the worst? And um, there seems to be some debate on that. And, and, and plus, who's got it bad now? You know, are, is it LGBTQ people? Who has it the worst? So it seems to be that there is a push and pull um, between different victim classes trying to figure out who has had it the worst. So in this video, I'm going to be exploring why folks, specifically black folks, feel like being a victim is something that they want to fight for. For example, uh, in a Facebook group, because you know I'm always into Facebook groups, they're having a discussion about slavery and, and someone posted a meme or a piece of, of a writing that basically said that slavery was something that that pretty much every group in in the world had had experienced at some point or another so that slavery wasn't just exclusive to blacks in america it's 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 still going on in some portions of of asia and africa right now but there was a big argument uh black folks were basically saying that well how long did the the slavery last for these people i mean is did theirs was their, their slavery wasn't as bad as uh, the slavery that our ancestors had to experience, so on and so forth. So, so again, there's this kind of volleying for who had it the worst. These folks were arguing that black folks had had it the worst. That, that their particular brand of slavery was worse than other brands of slavery. What I want to get to in this video is why that is. And I have two reasons that I think that that is. One I already discussed before, and that is uh, political power. I think that um, politicians have a lot to gain by selling you victimhood. They offer to help you. They, they say, you know, we, we know you've been aggrieved in the past, so we will come and, and you know, pay some sort of reparation, kind of a reparation. Now, I'm not saying that they pay reparations, but they do things to, to help um, by way of uh, pushing for things like affirmative action, pushing for policies that specifically help whatever uh, victimized group there is. By that method, um, politicians are able to, to, you know, get the media and everyone else involved in selling us uh, that victimhood has some sort of power. The other thing is that it, it gives you uh, it makes you feel morally superior to other people. If your group happens to be the group that was had been victimized, and then you have this other group over here that that you know we're, we're doing the victimizing, um, you know this the group that was victimized is, is able to m make the other group guilty or feel have some sort of guilt for what they have done in the past or what they d done just last week or whenever. Um, so that is a way to exercise sort of a moral a moral superiority over another group the other thing and this you have to bear with me because this is dealing with psychology a bit and this is something that i, I thought about a lot and I, I know that people probably would not like this thought um however i i think it has some some validity um and that is <clears throat> something like what I said in the intro people do not like to be on a losing team right 
and I and I explained in the intro that that you can be you can be at the top of your game. You could be the best player in your league, right? But if you don't have that championship, you'll still feel like a loser. It's for this reason that I think that many blacks who have made it are the most vocal about those who have not. Because we feel like as because we share the same skin color that we are on the same team, so to speak, right? So when someone speaks poorly of of blacks, we take it uh, you know, you take it to heart is you're talking about our teammates, you're talking about our team. And our team, if we're not doing well in the league, right? There has to be a reason for that. We have um, history of oppression and things like that. We can use that as a reason for why things have not gone the way we think they should go. Or use that as a reason for why we're not performing at the same rate as other groups. So again, it's, it's psychological and, and nobody wants to be on the losing team. Here I have the book, White Guilt. The passage that I'm about to read from White Guilt compares education and achievements in education to achievements in sports and, and entertainment. I think these things could also apply to not just education, but also to uh, you know business business achievements and things of that nature. But I, I'm going to read this part so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. It says a black achievement in music and sports should never be dismissed. Rather, it should point the way to black achievement in all other areas. Here is the self-possession, the assumption of full responsibility, the refusal to trade on one's plight, the engagement with the broader American mainstream, the insistence on excellence as the currency of advancement, all of which makes blacks utterly irrepressible in these areas. And then, in concert with this, come the hard work, imagination, discipline, sacrifice, relentless effort, and most important, openness to competition with all others that gave us, us our Ellingtons, Ellisons, and Kings. So he's saying that there's a, an importance in, in competition. This again uh, goes back to my point of your, my example of the, the, the team player. If we're losing, we're not, we're not very competitive. And especially if we're, if we're asking for assistance from an outside external source, uh, are we actually competing or are we, or are we, are we not? It's a question. So back to the reading. If a young black boy cannot dribble well, when he comes out to play basketball, no one will cast his problem as an injustice. No one will worry about his single parent home, the legacy of slavery that still touches his life or the inherent racial bias in a game invented by a white man. His deficiency will be allowed to be what it is, poor dribbling, and he will be told to tighten his game, which simply, simply means to practice more. Very likely, his peers will taunt him mercilessly, and even adults will give him no hugs to assuage his self-esteem. Very likely, he will live through all this without the consultations of a father. Moreover, the standard of excellence for dribbling will be so high that many will not reach it and nothing less than virtuosity will satisfy it. When and if he meets the standard, he will be told, you bad, even by his competitors. This expression, of course, means its literal opposite, that he has at least earned entree into a fraternity of nothing other than excellence. Surely he will feel proud of himself as a result. But. If this boy's problem is reading or writing rather than basketball, white guilt will certainly prevent even the modified version of this natural human process from occurring. Career hungry academics will appear in his little world and they will argue that his weaknesses reflect the circuitous workings of racism. His reading and writing problems will be seen to follow from countless racial and psychological determinism that make it impossible to ask that he and his family be fully responsible for overcoming these problems. 
The boy will not be asked to truly work harder, nor will he be guided in the mastery of the sentence structure, parts of speech, and verb tenses. No one will righteously insist that he speak correctly, as certain people once did for me. Yet he will be an object of abstract compassion for everyone. And permeating his classroom, like this, a stalled weather pattern, will be a foggy academic relativism in which scholastic excellence is associated with elitism and rote skill development with repression. Yet just beyond the window of his classroom, on the pockmarked basketball court with the netless and bent hoop, another weather pattern prevails. On that court, almost nothing is forgiven, and he will be blamed and held entirely responsible for all his deficiencies. And all through the torpor of a day structured to spare his feelings around reading, writing, and arithmetic, he will long to be on the other side of that window where everything is asked of him. So this was uh, extraordinarily powerful to me. It shows why competition is important. It, it, it explains what competition does for a person's psychological makeup. And if we are continuing to, to play the victim card and, and ask for assistance in education, ask for assistance in, 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 in building businesses, uh, you know, asking the government to help us and so on and so forth for on all these things, then what we're effectively doing is saying that we cannot compete um, with others. And I know the argument is going to be, well, we everybody else has had, or, or whites particularly, have had a uh, head start. And because they held us back and they oppressed us, uh, we should be given, you know, a, a step up, a, 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 you know, something to get us going. The problem is that, uh, you know, if you study some of these things, once uh, a lot of these things are implemented, they never stop because people have gotten used to them. So now if you've implemented, you know, say an affirmative action plan for education, when do we say, oh, we don't need it anymore? At what point is, is it no longer necessary? If you have, you know, other entitlement programs designed to help you know, people out of poverty, for instance, well, well, when does that stop? Because poverty will always be, I mean, poverty, like I've said in a previous video, poverty is the norm. Other things are not the norm. You know, poverty has always been here. People being rich is, is, you know, the oddity. All the psychological damage that is probably being done by not being able to compete, not being pushed to competition, those things are, are problematic. And, and what that passage just said was that, you know, in something like he was talking about basketball, basketball, uh, it was also something that was created by whites. The sport was created by whites. Uh, at one point it was dominated by whites, but we went in there and we, we worked hard and, and and very so hard that we are now you know the nba is 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 majority black because the black players just dominate we 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 do better and that that comes from hard work i mean a, a, most of that comes from a lot of people put a lot of work to 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 play professional basketball i mean this it's just grueling a lot of grueling work what he's saying is we're not asking that same thing of of many of us for for education or or for building businesses hard work and effort is something that that should be uh pushed upon us but if the thing if it is if, if people are saying well poor you poor you you can't compete here we'll just help you we're helping we're going to help you government comes in we're going to help you everybody's giving you help you become dependent on those people you become dependent on the government you can become dependent on others and that has to do something to you psychologically i wrote a piece about an inferiority complex within uh, the black community i i strongly believe that many folks in the within the community have somewhat of an inferiority complex um, about certain things now they'd never say it and and the thing of it is with an inferiority complex we tend to the things that we display uh, are that of power and, and 
that we have our stuff together. And you see this, uh, I don't know, there is some study that, that showed that, that, you know, blacks in America have the highest uh, self-esteem of anyone here. And I, I found that interesting. And then the, those with the lowest self-esteem were Asians. Now, Asians do the best in education. Blacks are, are on the bottom of the scale. So could it be that, that this, uh, you know, this kind of this bravado, this, this high self-esteem is, is, is not, it's not a good thing because you're, you're thinking you're, you're so much better than you actually are. It's people catering to your feelings, people telling you, you know, you, you're, you're okay and continuing to help you. You expect the help and you may get overconfident. I'm not saying that is what's happening. I'm just theorizing, making a th giving a theory here, but uh, I think the theory is pretty sound. At any rate, we don't want to be victims. We want to be able to compete with everybody else at the level that everybody else competes at, and we we don't need a helping hand from the government or anyone else. We just need to, you know, get it within our own minds that we can do this. I mean, there, we have lots of other folks that we can see to pattern ourselves after it's not it's f t totally okay to pattern yourself after anyone under the sun it doesn't matter what color they are just make sure that they have if they've had some su kind of success you can you can mirror that success and uh be successful yourself anyway again you can consider all kinds of things to be the problem with within, within black america but you should always consider culture i'm chi hit the subscribe button Hit the like button and I'll see you next time.